Well, welcome back to Life's Too Short. Uh, just real quick, in your program is a place to take some notes. We ask you to write things down when you're here, maybe to share with somebody later, to look up later. Also, out at the Life Desk or online, and maybe you're watching online today, you can go and download a study guide. We we've, we've provide those with every sermon series that, that go for each week to help you get deeper into the scriptures and, and maybe by yourself or with your life group or another group to kind of ask some questions and wrestle with your faith uh, on your own or with other people. So with that, we're going to continue what we started last week called Life is Too Short. And, and uh, today I want to get to what life's too short to do by telling you first about a story. Uh, when I was new at being a pastor, uh, after a couple years, I it was one night sitting around with a couple other pastors. We were at a men's retreat weekend, and, and uh, inevitably, pastors, we find each other because I don't know why we do it, but we sit around, and, and when pastors get together, we tend to tell stories. We tell stories that are good about the church, and that's all we ever tell is good stories. And so we're sitting around, and one of the guys was asking about you know, what called me to become a pastor, the calling to my life, and do I see that in other people? And one of the things we concluded is we don't see a lot of people feeling this call to some sort of full-time ministry, whether it's being a pastor or working in the church or maybe in a ministry outside of the church. And um, it became pretty clear to me at that point that one of the reasons I think some people wouldn't feel called in the ministry or maybe feel called and were hesitant to talk about it was because of me. Um, and by that, I mean, when I first started as a pastor, uh, I worked at a feverish pace. I worked all the time. And not only did I work all the time, I made sure everybody who was around me knew it. I did. I made sure everybody knew about all the meetings that I had to do and all the conferences that I had and all the paperwork I had to fill out, not to mention going to the hospital to visit with so-and-so or the funeral with so-and-so or the wedding or the classes and the papers that I had to write, all of that on top of my kids and my family and all of that. And, and it dawned on me that no wonder nobody would want to follow after me in ministry because I made it sound miserable. And you know why I did it? It was because I needed validation. Somehow, some way, something within me said, Ben, you're not quite the pastor until some of you notice and tell me, way to go, Ben, or thank you for being there. All, regardless of my motivations, I was the worst advert marketer of somebody going into full-time ministry, and I hated that about myself at the moment because what was true at the same time was this life that I live is the greatest life I could ever imagine. It is. I love this, and it, which is why I've had to change how I talk about what I do and, and how I work, and, and not because I don't do a lot of stuff, but it's because if you feel a nudge, I want you to know that this is the greatest life possible. Um, and I realize that life is too short to just simply work and work and work all the time. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Life's too short to work all the time. We're going to do it by talking about a couple different words that are in the scriptures, words that we don't use very often. And the first one I'm going to pull from uh, St. Paul, the one who we named this church after. He's written a lot of your New Testament, and he's writing to a church in Corinth, and this is what he tells them. This is what he tells us. He says, to be steadfast, he's telling the church, to be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so the first word we, I want us to focus on today is about abounding. How many of you have used the word abound last week in casual conversation? None. Go do it this week. It'll blow away your coworkers. It'll make them think you're smart. No, it's abounding. Abound means to overflow. It, it means to excel. It, it means to, to pour a lot of energy into, into something. And that's what God calls us to do. In another place in Scripture, Paul says that whatever you do, whatever your job is, work at it with all of your heart. Give it everything you've got as though you're working for the, the Lord and not for human masters, which I know is probably hard to hear if your boss is a jerk. Um, See, the idea here is that God gives us all work to do. He does. He gives us work and he expects us to do it. Now, it's work whether we're paid for it or not, whether it's something that we volunteer our time to, maybe we're retired and we don't have that nine to five sort of thing, or maybe you work in an office or a church or a school, your neighborhood, whatever it is, God gives us work to do. God works. 
We hear that from the very beginning of creation. God made the world and he created and he created. And then it tells us that God made us in God's image, which means we are made to create. And to create, guess what you have to do? You have to work. We are created to work. Over and over in the scriptures, it tells us that God is basically telling us he wants us to excel at what we do. I want you to abound in your work. I want you to take the gifts and the talents that I've given you and, and use them to the fullest that you're able as though you're doing it for the Lord. That's what he wants us to do. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon is writing, he phrases it this way. He says that whatever you find your hand, whatever your hand finds you doing, do it with all of your might. Essentially, basically saying, whatever it is you're doing, don't just punch the clock. And I've been guilty of this at work. Uh, I'm just here. Just don't punch the exactly. Don't just punch the clock. Whatever it is you're doing, do it with all of your might. You're working in an office, do it with all your might. You're working at Taco Bell, do it with all your might and get me the best taco possible. You know, the way they look in the commercials, just like that. Whatever it is, do it with all of your mind, you have been placed here to abound in the work. Now, I want to tell you an example that I, I read about of not abounding. And before I do it, I, I need to ask, are there any Chicago Cubs fans in the room? I see a couple. I'm so sorry. And if you're online watching this, uh, how about Cardinals fans? See, I'm preaching to the choir over here because in 2002, I saw this thing about the Cubs had to call a special team meeting. The, the general manager called this team meeting because at one of the games, one of the players in uniform there was caught on camera sleeping during the game. Now, in their defense, it is the Cubs. But that is, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, by the way, is not abounding right? So on one thing, we're supposed to abound with the work. But then there's another word that we need to learn too. They equally go hand in hand with one another. This is the words from Jesus. Jesus tells us this in his gospel that John writes. Jesus says, you need to abide in me as I abide in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither you can unless you abide in me. So the other word is abide. Abound and abide. Again, words that you don't use very often, right? Very rarely. I've never told my wife, honey, I'm going to go relax and abide. But we need to learn it. Abound and abide. Abiding is also translated to remain. Maybe your scriptures say you are to remain in me. It's this idea that apart from Jesus, you can't do all the great things you need to on your own merits and on your, your own skills and by your hard work. You have to abide. And it's very important for us to do this, especially in our modern culture. This is very difficult. But we need to abide, remain, or linger, or dwell. Those are the words that this encapsulates. In our world, you might hear people say things like, you know, I need to live a, a centered or a, a deeply spiritually rooted life. You, know, you might hear something like that. That is the concept of abiding. Listen, I, I want to be a great pastor. I want to work hard at the same time. I want to be a man of deep prayer. I want to live a fully authentic life. I, I don't want to just skim through life or, or hydroplane over life because of my emotions going up or down. I don't want that. I want some depth to my life. I, I want to go through life and do great work, but I don't want to be obsessed about it. I, I don't want to be driven and that crazed person that nobody likes because I am so busy all the time. I, I don't want to live in this frenzied pace that I have in the past. Why? Because living it is certifiably insane. You cannot keep up. I want to be a really, really good dad. Even though my kids are all old and moved away, I want to learn how to be the best dad possible to adult kids. I want to learn more and more what it means to be in this incredible marriage with my wife, Tammy. I want to abide. I want to have deep, intimate, open, life-giving relationships with some others. Not everybody. I'm kind of introverted but at least some. I want that. Doesn't that sound good? You see, it's an invitation that Jesus gives us. 
He says this to us as well in the Gospel of Matthew. He tells you to come to me, all who are weary and burdened. I would say all of you who work to death. He says, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart. And you will rest, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, I have found myself over the last decade or so in this position of, on one hand, to do things the way I'm wired, which is to work, which is to achieve things, which is to conquer things, to, you know, to risk and to sacrifice and to overcome whatever that next fight is. I have to have this balance between that urge and the ability to abide. Rest because what I've learned is this abounding without abiding leads to burnout. Doing everything you can in life as hard as you can, as though it's all just depending on you, is going to burn you out. And on the other side, though, Christian people, we need to know that abiding without abounding, it'll make us be like a monk. Yeah, we might get close to God, but we're not going to feel that full life that we're supposed to whenever we are connected with other people and working towards a purpose. Abound and abide. And so we have to figure this out. There's a tension that we have to live with, and I want to talk about this tension. I'm going to do it by way of some observations made into questions. And the first one is this. When do you think you can expect this tension between abounding and abiding to ever go away? Um, the answer is never. Well, not here. When you die, you can quit worrying about abounding and abiding. And just so you know, this isn't just us. Jesus wrestled with all of this too. And Jesus, when you read in the New Testament, you'll see that he comes to the time of his ministry, he is baptized by John, and then instantly from there, the Holy Spirit takes him away out into the wilderness, a time to rest, a time to think, a time to prepare for what's to come, and then he emerges and begins his public ministry. But time and time again, Jesus still took time away. In the Gospel of Mark, it tells us about a time it says this, that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He did this often. He then left the house, and he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And so you see right from the start, Jesus, on the beginning of that particular day, is away doing what? He's abiding. And then at some point, we don't know exactly how long it took. In your Bible, it's the very next verse. But we see Peter, and Peter is looking for Jesus, and he comes to him, and he finds him, and he's like, Jesus, what are you doing? Where have you been? Everybody's looking for you. We, we sent you emails and texts. Okay, they don't have that, but you get the idea. We can't find you. Where are you at? And, and in this encounter between Jesus and Peter, there's this interesting thing, because Jesus doesn't then go to Peter and answer him and say, hey, dude, check this out. I'm abiding. Just let, leave me be. No, what you'll see is immediately Jesus says, okay, okay, I've got work to do. Let's go do this. I've got people to teach. I've got uh, lives to change, people to heal. You see, Jesus had these times to abide and then instantly into abound, back and forth, this tension, this rhythm, and followers of Jesus have to understand this and embrace this as well. Every human being who is interested in following Jesus has to wrestle with this tension for the rest of our lives. And it's not going to get easier. Now, I believe that it's harder today than ever before, but I have to admit that I'm naive and I'm young. I, I wasn't around like before, and so I have a very limited scope. But, and, and from what I see, we live in a world that celebrates and glorifies and actually uh, sets on the pedestal the hard work and, you know, the pull up your bootstraps, your self-made. That is something that, that we idolize in our country. So it's, it is good to work like crazy, and we have adopted this. There's a sociologist by the name of uh, Arlie Hochild, and she, she found that the typical average in, in America, husband-wife pair, between the two of them work uh, 90 hours or more a week, and that is outside of the house. That's somewhere else. Uh, and then on top of that, there's housework and there's kids and all of these things. And through all of her discovery, she realized that the average husband spends more time doing housework than the average wife does. She didn't. I made that up. Yeah. I, I could tell some of you are like, I don't think 
you said that right. And no, I didn't. But it points to this notion that we are frenzied workers, and yet we don't have time to rest. This will be the tension. Which leads me to the next observation. Again, a question. If you're going to live with this tension, who's responsible for getting this right? For me, who's responsible for getting it right? It's me. Who's responsible for getting this right for you? It's not me. It's you. You have to embrace this. You have to accept it because here's the thing. We often don't get this right. It boggles my mind that people will push off the responsibility for their lives, their one and only lives, to other people. And we end up not living the lives that God has intended for us to do. We're not abounding in God's work. We're not abiding in His love. And all the while, we blame somebody else for it. We are little bitty excuse factories in life. Wait, wait, wait. I can't speak for you, right? I am a little bitty excuse factory in life, and I, and I come up with all sorts of excuses. We can live our whole lives not abounding in God's work. We can live our whole lives not whatever we find in our hands, doing it with all of our might. And it could always be somebody's fault, but listen, it is up to us. How many of you have ever worked in an environment where your boss or your supervisor says, hey, John, man, you have worked really hard, way to go. Why don't you take some paid time off and abide? It's one of the things I try to do with my staff now because it is important. It is your responsibility because your boss isn't going to give you the time. Your grandkids or your kids, they certainly aren't going to give you the time. The spouse isn't going to give you the time, right? The government isn't going to give you the time. The chiefs will after this weekend. No, no, no. I'm rooting for them now that my team is out. But you get this. It is our responsibility. I believe that one day God's got to come and he's going to ask me. He's going to ask all of us, Ben, what did you do with this one and only life? Did you abound in the work that I gave you? And did you abide in my love? And he's not going to wonder about whether my boss gave me the chance or whether the economic downturn that may or may not have happened have forced me to change the way I were. He doesn't care about that. He's going to say, Ben, what did you do? Did you abound? Or did you abide? Which leads me to my last observation And again, I want to make this into a question because for me, I have to do certain things to remind me to live this sort of life, to to not get so full into abounding that I don't abide and vice versa. And I have to make practices. I have to do practical things. And so I want to ask you, what are some of these practices that we could develop that can help us in this abounding and abiding? How do we do it? And and the first one I I just want to name because we saw it in Jesus and it's this, it's called solitude. You have to to get some time for solitude, being alone, being quiet, being still. Which I know for some of you right now, hearing that freaks you out. Because it does to me. I'm the guy that wakes up in the morning and the first thing I do is turn on Sports Center. Not because I care, but because it's noise. You have to get solitude. You have to get time away. And when you embrace that, life will be different. And listen, how are you ever going to get free? How are you ever going to take time away? <laughs> you got to take it. See, when I embraced this idea, I thought to myself, man, one of these days, I'm going to get some solitude. I'm going to get a whole day away. And then I waited for that day. And I waited for that day. And I even worked for the church. And I waited for that day. And you know, when my boss came to me and said, Ben, here's the day. You're going to have a day away for solitude. You know when that day happened? It didn't. And my boss is Aaron, great guy. But I had to take it. And listen, if this idea of solitude is new to you, uh, don't go all commando on it. Don't go crazy on it. Don't think, oh man, Ben has inspired me. I need to go get some solitude. I'm going to take a whole day away in quiet. Because if you have never done it before, it's going to drive you nuts. Because I did that. Start small. You know, we see in the, in the Gospels, Jesus got up in the morning, he went away, a time of quiet. So maybe it's just a little bit. Maybe it's 10 minutes. Maybe it's uh, some time at work. You take your lunch break. You just go. Everything's off. Some peace, some quiet, some solitude. Do it. And remember that it's up to you because solitude, it, here's what I've realized, is it actually leads to 
freedom. When you have some solitude, when you have some quiet and some peace, when you abide in who Jesus is, all of a sudden you feel freer because it's in those moments that you hear the voice. You hear God say, yeah, it's all crazy, but you are okay. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. You don't hear it unless you abide. And Jesus' followers all through the centuries have been doing this. They understand that freedom in Christ comes when we abide in Christ. And again, like I said, when I realized this, and it was life-changing, but again, you have to to do it. And if it's important to you, do, again, this is practical stuff, but schedule it. If you look on my calendar, uh, my Google calendar for this week on Thursday, it says day, prayer day away. I have to do that once a month. I do little bits here or there, but I have to do that once a month and put it on my calendar because the reality is if I don't schedule it, then it's not important enough to me. If I don't schedule it, then somebody's going to call me and say, hey, Ben, can we go grab lunch and talk about this? Or can you meet with me with this? And I have learned to look at my calendar first before I tell you yes and to realize that that day is sacred. It's solitude. It's abiding. So it's up to you. Another practice is this, gathering together. You have times when we're alone, but we also need to gather together. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us to not neglect gathering together amongst other people to worship God and to learn together, which is what we're doing here right now. That's what we do in worship. People in the early church knew this. They, they realized that they had to come together together to learn and to grow and and to get some teaching. And they would devote themselves and arrange their lives around this stuff. Why? It's because they knew that beyond the hard work and the family and all of those things, for them to remain consistent and, and able to do what God calls them to do, they needed to have moments to abide and they needed moments to connect with others. Now, for some of you introverts, that sounds a little crazy, and I get that. I'm an introvert as well, but I know this is true. There is something about coming together in a group of people that are a little bit different, and some of you are a lot different than, than, than me, and, and simply being, simply praising, maybe hearing something new. We gather together. But it's not just that. It's not just about being alone in solitude. It's not just coming to worship like this. It's also about gathering the community. Because you and I know that you can go to church with a bunch of other people and yet not find community or or not feel connections. And we are wired to be connected to other people. Even the introverts in the room, we are wired to connect at least with a small amount of people. And that's what we call community. At St. Paul's, we call this a life group. But listen, we are created to do that. To be with those people that that can be around you when you have your hurts and your habits or your hang-ups or, or life is tough or you're working too hard. You need somebody who is, who is honest enough and able to tell you, Ben, you need to slow down. Some people that you can just relax with. A community. Listen, life is too short to get this wrong. I have a sharp awareness now more than I ever did, about how short life is. And, and maybe that's because I visit with people who um, are about to die or families who are grieving. But I know that life is too short. But I have a dream for myself, and believe it or not, for you, for this church, that, that one day we'll meet God, and God is going to say to me, God is going to say to you, to us, to our church, St. Paul's, he's going to say, well done. You abounded in my work, and you conquered uh, hills, and you fought the fight, and you took big risks, and you dreamed big dreams, and you rolled up your sleeves, and you sacrificed a lot, and you poured yourself out for this kingdom and for this community, and at the same time, you slowed down, and you abided. You spent intimate time alone with me. You devoted yourself to gathering together and worship you. You made yourself vulnerable enough to be a part of a group of other people. Well done. My dream is that God says that to us. That He says, you were formed for relationships and you did it. You entered into community, you did it. You took risk, you worked hard, and you abided in my love. I hope God says that to you one day. Abide. 
about. Because life's too short to do it any other way. Let's pray. God, I can speak for myself that more often than not, I lean more towards abounding than not abiding. So God, I ask for forgiveness for those times where I have used my work and my job and my calendar and my schedule to somehow feel validated in life. All I need to do is be still and be validated by you. God, I pray that for those of us who need to hear it, that you tell us right now that it is okay to stop, to rest, to simply be. And then, God, you inspire us to leave this place changed and new, more like the people you created us to be. God, help us to use this one and only life the way that you want us to. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite uh, Tal Krim and Erlene and Bill Kelly to come on up. We're um, going to have some lights come up, and I- I'm going to come down to the floor. So come on up here, and here's Tal, Arlene, and Billy, Tal. <laughs> oh, Bill? Did I call you Billy? I'm, I beg your excuse. I'm sorry. My dad's name is Bill, and um, he said he hadn't been Billy since he was eight. And so I got in trouble. And Arlene, nice to meet you. I'm going to have you guys over here. Um, the three of them have come to become members of St. Paul's, and and actually, let's have you kind of line up a little bit more, because all they can see is your backs. There we go. (laughs) Hey, this is everybody, and uh, and they've been here for a while. Tal, I've seen you quite a bit, and what they know is that becoming a member of a church isn't about some sort of special privilege, right? They told you about this. There's no secret handshake, and, and you don't get the front parking spot. Is that right? Really. If anything, joining a church means you are becoming a part of a mission and doing everything you can to help people connect in that mission as well, even if that means parking further back. Hint, hint, hint. Um, But that's what it means. It says that you're going to put your spiritual roots down here and and make this mission of leading people to an active faith in Jesus Christ your mission as well. And so I want to ask you a few questions, and I'm going to ask you all a few questions, even the balcony people up there. And I want to start with this. Did the three of you confess a faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life and the Savior of your life? If so, say, I do. I do. And will you become a part of this body in good and in bad to, to support the people around you, to lift them up, and yet let them do the same for you? If so, say, I will. Amen. And will you be a part of this group? And with your time and with your prayers and with your gifts and your service to this mission of leading people to an act of faith in Jesus, if so, say, I will. will. And for all of you out there, I want to ask, uh, will you accept them as members into this body, into this mission, knowing that to do that means you're going to have to get to know some new people? Will you be there for them in the celebrations of life and maybe even in the not so good times of life, and will you let them be there for you as well? If so, say, we will. will. And again, we will. will. I just want to shake your hand. It is an honor to be one of your pastors. Welcome. Welcome, Bill. Welcome. (laughs) All right, I'm going to let you guys go um, back to your seats. And if you know them, um, congratulate them today. It's a big deal to uh, put your roots into a community that I believe is changing the world. So let's do this. Let's stand together um, as we prepare to go out and uh, know that when you leave, um, you are to work really hard, right? (laughs) And you are to rest, abound and abide. The only people that are going to be responsible for doing this is you. So choose well and know that wherever you find yourself, in the abounding or abiding, know that you are not alone, that Jesus is with you. So work hard or rest well 
in his grace and in his peace, in his power and his love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.